before I talk to Lauren more about this project, I want to mention that she is um, an accomplished artist who has public art installations all over Seattle, all over the world. Um, and we've been honored to have her be our artist in residence for the past year at Den Show. Um, we'll link to her website at the end of this program. So if you're not already familiar with her other work beyond what you're going to see today, uh, I really encourage you to go check her out and, and become more familiar with her work. Um, and yeah, before uh, I start um, asking Lauren questions about this project that we're all about to see, um, I just want to provide a little bit more context for this event. So um, I'm sure everyone who's tuned in knows that today is the 80th anniversary of the signing of Executive Order 9066. Um, and as my colleagues and I were just um, reminded at a protest at the Northwest Detention Center and a commemoration at the Puyallup Fairgrounds, uh, Day of Remembrance is not just a passive commemoration, um, but rather it's part of this really long tradition of radical remembrance. And so when Densho colleagues and I were talking about how to mark this 80th anniversary of DOR, um, we wanted to think of an innovative way to uh, really bring the community together in a collaborative way um, and also COVID safe way um, to collectively partake in this radical act of remembrance. And so we came up with this idea of working with Lauren um, and creating a community curated art piece that would um, really bring together a lot of different people's experiences and memories and um, commemorations of their ancestors and relatives who were in the camps and have this enduring piece of art that could uh, live in the Densho community space for, for, several, for years to come. Um, so we worked with Lauren and asked the Densho community to share memory objects with us that commemorated either their own time in camp or the experiences of their relatives. And Lauren's going to tell us a little bit more about this project. Um, and as she does that, I want to also invite you all to write questions that you might have for her in the chat. Um, towards the end of this program, we're going to have a chance to um, at, do a little bit more of a Q&A. So if you have any questions about process or um, what's in the memory net or, or Lauren's thoughts on it, please do share your share your questions in the chat, chat and I'll be um, reviewing that and selecting questions to ask to her. Um, all right, so Lauren, can you tell us a little bit more about this beautiful piece of artwork that is draped all around you? Yeah, so this is um, a piece of art that's a temporary, normally a temporary art installation, but this one will be permanently installed in the Densho uh, community space here. Um, this is a 30 foot long by 42 inch wide paper cut installation that I call the memory net that I've done several times. Um, I've done it in different countries like Cambodia. Um, I've done it in Seattle. I've done it as a community art project and as a art project to um, express my, myself and my own personal set of memory objects. Um, but I really like opening this up to the community like we've done this time with Dencho. Um, taking input from community members about objects that either were sources of inspiration or resilience or strength during the incarceration during World War II or also objects that might have been lost in that process. Um, the cool thing about the memory net is that you don't need to actually have the object, you just need to remember the object or have heard a story about the object. So each of these objects, I'd say there's probably close to 50 objects now in this net. Um, have a really profound story behind them. So some are from community members and some are from my own family's history. Um, and some are just symbolic objects that I use repeatedly in my work. Yeah. Yeah, so that's been a really exciting part of this is just seeing everyone's submissions come in and hearing the stories that come along with these objects. It's been really touching. Um, so I know I'm really eager to have you dive in and tell us more about those objects. Yeah, so I think we have a, a slideshow we can share, hopefully, get a little bit more detail. This piece was a, yeah, you can see a couple examples of memory nets that I've done before. This one's actually 60 feet long, and it was installed temporarily at the Fremont Foundry in 2017. This was at Art Exchange Gallery in Pioneer Square, my representing gallery. Um, so I've cut the net. Uh, this will be my third full memory net that I've cut. So 
So for example, one of the objects um, that was submitted is the Tsuru or um, origami crane. So the origami crane actually is something that I use a lot symbolically in my work, especially during COVID. Um, it's a sign of resilience and hope during difficult times. Um, and the legend says that if you fold a thousand paper cranes and you have a wish, your wish will come true. So I really love this as a symbol and I keep repeating it in my work anyway. So it was great that somebody um, thought to include that in the memory net this time. Um, this is my representation of the small shells that people who are incarcerated at Thule Lake um, would collect from the sandy, uh, what used to be a lake bed that was a dried up desert area when people were incarcerated there. Um, these are teeny tiny little white shells that people used to go and sift through the sand, pick them up, bleach them, and then make jewelry out of them. So on the left side, you can see my, my rendition of a jar of shells. And on the right side, you can see objects that um, were actually made in camp from uh, those shells. So they often painted them with nail polish and used that as a craft to give to each other or pass the time. Yeah. I love that you, okay. in, you can oh. see in the net, there's nail polish bottles as well. And then th this is a pair of glasses, um, reading glasses that I often repeat in my work for memory nets and for other pieces of art. Um, the glasses to me are part of my language of objects and they represent the idea of uh, pursuing education or, or holding yourself to a higher sense of morality even when you're actively being oppressed. Um, so this is kind of a general symbol that I repeat often in my work. There's several pairs of um, reading glasses in this memory net. Um, this is a mulberry leaf and a silkworm. So the silkworm only eats mulberry leaves. And my ancestors were um, silk kimono dyers in Fukushima province before they came here around the turn of the century to be fruit farmers in uh, Northern California before they were incarcerated at Tule Lake. Um, this also symbolizes my grandma Clara's participation in the World's Fair to 1939, just before the war. Uh, she was an English speaking docent for the silk exhibition at the Japanese pavilion at Treasure Island outside San Francisco in the 19, 1939 World's Fair. That's incredible. Um, yeah, and I think we have time to have you run through the rest of the objects that you've selected to okay. chat about. This is the famous hot dog on a fork um, or weenie, weenie, weenie on a fork. Um, a lot of in the oral histories, like in the research that I've done uh, during my Dencho artist in residence year last year, um, I listened to a lot of oral histories and really like dug deeper into my research about what life was like in, in the camps. And um, a lot of people were complaining about the food because the food made them sick in the beginning, especially um, they were used to eating Japanese food and, and suddenly they were forced to eat a lot of processed foods and cafeteria style foods that were not uh, Japanese at all. So a lot of people remember these hot dogs from their <laughs> Yeah, uh, these, are, experience. these are featured prominently in uh, one of our episodes, episodes of Kampu as well. And um, even just, you know, reading the transcript and listening to the episode and the editing, it's like, you know, do not do this anytime near when you've eaten <laughs> or yeah. Yeah, it's, like, it's really nauseating. It was really, really they just seem horrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's a few of those in, in this net as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a strawberry, and this is submitted by um, Christy from Dencho, actually, and her family owned a strawberry farm on Bainbridge Island before World War II. So this is kind of also for me like a general symbol of the Japanese contribution to agriculture, which was so prominent before World War II, including my family um, had an orchard in Northern California where they grew uh, pears, plums, and peaches. And then like lost 
lost all of that afterwards. So in, in my family's case, um, everybody had to restart and uh, my family ended up growing potatoes in rural Washington instead of having their nice fruit farm in Northern California. Um, so this is kind of an homage to all the agriculture workers who lost their farms during incarceration. Yeah, I remember seeing your your potato contribution to the memory net too. Yeah, we have potato, we have persimmon, we have pears, plums. Yeah. Um, this is a baby bottle. So this piece is um, was this object was submitted by a community member as well. Um, her grandmother gave birth in one of the camps and it was a very traumatic experience for her um, and so I wanted to put a baby bottle in there um, she suggested the baby bottle specifically as a symbol but uh, that's been a topic that's really on my mind um, lately as I get ready to have my first kid and also during my um, research for Dentro last year for my exhibition Citizens Indefinite Leave um, thinking like I compiled a list with the archivist from Dencho of all the names of the children who were born in Tule Lake and their serial, their um, prisoner numbers and learned a bit. I still have a lot of research I'd like to do about the conditions that they were born in and how it was getting formula or health care or um, that experience for those kids who were born in camp. Well, I appreciate the preview to um, upcoming work that we might see from you. Yeah, it's definitely a topic that I'm really interested in and also drawing parallels to incarcerated children today in the United States. Um, so yeah, it's definitely going to show up in my work in this coming year. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for uh, showing us all of these objects. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to say about this last slide of objects? I don't think so. Um, I think, yeah, if anybody has specific questions about objects, I tried to include as many objects as I could from the community input and I got most of them, but not not all of them fit into the size parameters um, that I needed to work with. But I tried to be creative about symbolically representing some of the ideas that were in the entry. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think we mentioned this when we um, put out the call for submissions, but we're going to try to find some way that, you know, even if the objects didn't appear in the memory net itself, we're going to try to find some way to represent them in a catalog or um, booklet that accompanies the memory net. So they'll be right. represented somewhere. So, um, and now we're, we're really lucky to have uh, Lane um, join us. He submitted an object and he's going to join us to um, talk about it. So I'll hand it over to you too. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks Hi, Lane. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me. Um, and then everyone on the line, my name is Lane Tomosumi Shikihara. I'm a Gose, uh, fifth generation Japanese American um, based out of Seattle, uh, similar to Lauren. And really, uh, the medium I chose to do my art is haiku, uh, so Japanese poetry. Um, behind that and want to spark some meaningful conversations as well as uh, intentional introspection along the way. Great. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for your submission. So this is your my rendition of your submission. This is um, a rolled up diploma. Uh, the photograph that you sent was your grandmother, right? With her high school diploma. Yes. Can you tell is... me a little bit about that story? Absolutely. And it's um, quite a tale, I, I want to say. In um, There is a photo on the slideshow that shows my grandmother on my maternal side uh, wearing her cap and gown in September 1943. And you'd think that'd be a normal place, but she actually graduated in the Jerome, Arkansas uh, camp relocation center. And she had been forcibly removed from her school in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, and forced to go with her family to Jerome. And so she wasn't able to actually receive her high school diploma from McKinley High School uh, in Honolulu. So that is uh, where this diploma and memory net object is uh, coming from uh, for inspiring hope as well as uh, perseverance during really hard times. And there is coming full circle. Um, that's her in her cap and gown, uh, 18 years old. Um, but in our next photo, in 2015, 17 or seven years, I should say, 
uh, ago, my uncle actually read in the newspaper um, that former internees were actually getting honorary diplomas. So he was thinking for history's sake, it would be a really good shot for uh, my grandmother, Sarah Yomoki Sato, uh, to try and get one as well. And fortunately, um, she actually received and is the first former internee from the state of Hawaii to be honored with this high school diploma. Um, so 72, or I should say now 80 years, because it was awarded to her in 2015. Um, but now she has her diploma and she can tell uh, the grandkids, future generations as well about it. That's such an interesting story. Thank you for submitting this object and for sharing that with us. Um, I'm, I'm curious just because uh, we seem to be around the same age, like what motivates you to, to do more research or to dig deeper into your family heritage and your family's history? It really stems from uh, my grandparents, um, from uh, my grandmother who has received her diploma to my grandfather. Uh, both grandfathers served in the MIS, the Military Intelligence Service, um, during separate times. So hearing their stories, sharing it, also uh, being fortunate enough to be grown and raised around the Seattle area, being able to volunteer for organizations such as Densho, uh, the Nisei Veterans uh, Committee, as well as Nisei Veterans Foundation, uh, really sparked uh, not only with myself, but uh, my sibling, my older brother, James, uh, my cousins as well, uh, really put in that act of volunteerism moving forward. And we want to continue uh, pushing forward too with everything uh, that's coming up ahead. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Lane, we might have to uh, hook you into the Densho Volunteer Network now that I hear that you're interested in doing more volunteer work. Um, and just want to mention too that my colleague Nina dropped a link to Lane's website in the chat as well. So if you want to check out more of his haiku, um, please check that out. There it is again. Um, all right, great. So we've had a couple of questions uh, come in. There's one in the Q&A, and I just want to encourage people again to um, write any questions you might have for Lauren, either in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, but yeah, the first question that's in here is about what kind of um, paper you use. And so I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about um, the your process and the, yeah, the paper and other um, parts of this that, that you incorporate into the memory net. Okay. Um, yeah, so the paper is just normal drawing paper. This paper is Strathmore, uh, one roll of Strathmore paper, and then the objects are created from uh, watercolor paper. That's a little bit heavier duty. I've actually never done a color object memory net before this time, um, so this is a new experience for me. Normally I cut every object into the net as one sheet of paper, um, but this has been fun to play with watercolor and kind of add another dimension to it. Um, I use a scalpel as an exacto knife um, to cut everything. And the whole net takes me, the net itself takes me about 40 hours. And then the objects probably took me in total another 20 or 25 hours to finish. Um, but I'm a paper cutter of all kinds. So I actually make a lot of work for exhibition um, that's super fine, super highly detailed and I do um, translate my designs into public art as well. So painted mural and cut metal and stuff like that too. Yeah, but this is a really fun um, project that I have done for many years now and I'm really excited to apply it to this context. I also did another one that was kind of talking about um, people's ideas of the place they called home, what ideas they had about where they felt like their home was and then um, highlighting issues of homelessness. That was in 2017 or 2018. So yeah, I think this as a symbolic object has itself has a lot of potential and I'm really excited to apply it to this topic for this day of remembrance. And you mentioned that in the past when you've made memory nets, they're um, kind of intentionally ephemeral. So can you talk about, you know, more with the thinking behind that and how this one exists a little differently? Yeah, so the kind of the concept, the deeper concept of the memory net is about um, dredging up symbolic objects that remind us of memories or that tell stories. 
Um, so that means that we can access memories that we have or um, parts of our ancestors' history without actually still having those objects. Um, so the idea is that the memory net kind of sifts through space and time and dredges up symbolic objects that we can use for sharing information about our collective histories and our individual heritages and experiences. Um, and yeah, I like that it's made from paper and people often ask me if I'm afraid that it's going to break and it does break. Um, I have taken it into the ocean. I have put it on a boat. I've strung it through a house. Um, I've taken it all around the world and it does eventually decompose and break and scatter and that's okay. I've burned one as well um, because I like the idea that uh, it's okay for us to to lose these real objects and they're always there as memories when we want to access them. So I think the, the fragility of the paper is the perfect symbolic way to represent that idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful. Um, although as somebody who works in archives and history, I just <laughs> <laughs> makes, makes you cringe. Why? <laughs> no, don't burn it. <laughs> yeah, the gallery um, doesn't love that either. But. <laughs> part of my process so yeah. <laughs> yeah. um well all right I missed this question in the chat but Nina just texted me and said that um we received a question about whether or not any of the objects were surprising to you um so if you can talk a little bit more about that yeah there were a lot of really really surprising objects I really love to open it up to community input because things that I would never think of people did suggest yeah that's a really good question um, let's see, an example of that, well, this one, this is the last object I haven't cut yet, but I will cut it. Um, these, this is a string of bullets, like machine gun bullets. Somebody um, wrote in that the, she remembers the guards pointing a machine gun at her um, when she was eight years old. And so that was like a really powerful, violent, you know, symbolic object that I wanted to represent with these bullets. That was surprising. Um, I really like the sunflower too, because it's like this ray of hope, you know, I could think about being in like a very arid desert climate in Topaz, and I'm sure that seeing a sunflower growing would, would give people hope and some sense of beauty. I know that um, my grandmother often told me about how she, when she was at Tule Lake, she didn't see a tree for so many years. She was really missing plant life because they were in the desert, you know, so that this one struck me as being really profound too. Um, what else do we have over there? Oh, the typewriter, the Underwood typewriter. Could you hand me that? <laughs> um, was interesting. So there's a, a typewriter and a camera. Um, and both of these are obviously really old style. The Underwood typewriter I thought was interesting. Like, um, also kind of referencing the box in front of the computer here that's full of um, silverware that my, my great grandmother brought to um, Tule Lake with her. And the story goes, she would not leave home without that box of real silverware because it was so dear to her. But I mean, dragging around a typewriter or risking having a camera in a place that you knew you weren't supposed to have a camera definitely was a profound symbolic you know, image. Um, We're getting a couple more um, questions in the chat, so I might divert your attention yep. to that. Um, uh, first of all, some uh, someone's asking if we can, if this will be open to the public, and um, I'm hoping that this summer, by the summer, it'll be safe to have some kind of in-person gathering here at the office, so um, keep your eyes peeled. We'll definitely post information about that on our website and in our e-news whenever we're able to do that. Um, so unfortunately for now, it's not going to be open to the public. Uh, Dentro staff's barely even back at the office ourselves, um, just coming in occasionally. Um, and then uh, Carla is asking about how long your family was in camp. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about your family's camp experience in general too, Lauren. My personal family. Yeah, um, yeah so I my real grandmother, Mildred, and her um, two younger siblings and her parents stayed in camp for the whole duration of the war. 
um, my grandma Clara, who is actually my real grandmother's older sister, so she would be my great aunt, but I refer to her as Grandma Clara now. Um, she's still alive in West Seattle. She's 102 years old. Um, she had something called a Citizens Indefinite Leave Pass. Uh, she was engaged to a man who got two uh, non-Japanese sponsors outside of, um, like in Seattle, to vouch for him. And so she was he was able to leave first to find employment, I think in Wyoming first and then in Spokane, Washington. And she actually took a train alone from Thule Lake to Spokane, Washington. Um, so Northern California to Spokane, Washington and had a really interesting story about um, American troops who were either just coming back from fighting overseas or just going to fight overseas on the same train as her. And she was really scared because she's Japanese obviously. Um, so she hit her face and wouldn't leave her seat for the entire journey. Um, yeah, so they were in Thule Lake mostly. And that seemed to be mostly geographical because they were originally from Northern California. Um, yeah. Um, we also have another question about the connection between your different art forms. Um, so mural, book arts, um, paper cutaway art. Yeah, um, I started cutting paper a long time ago. I, I showed first my first paper cut exhibition in 2014 called Castle Rock is for Lovers. And that was at the Cornish College of the Arts Alumni Gallery. And it was um, based on photos that my grandma Clara has kept. She has a very extensive um, photographic album collection from the first photo that my great grandfather sent over to entice my great grandmother to sign up to be a picture bride and, and come over um, all the way through the war and after into their resettlement in Moses Lake. And this amazing um, treasure that I've been given is these amazing photographic albums. And so I just keep, um, along with Dentro archives, which I discovered many, many years ago in the beginning of this paper cutting journey. Um, I just kind of kept doing research and kept um, telling the stories of my personal ancestors and other people's stories, that I, things that I was learning from the Dentro archives. Um, and then that just is applied to large paper cut installation. It's applied to two, like two dimensional or framed pieces for um, exhibition in galleries. And now it's translated into public art. I'm doing a uh, garage door for the Washington State Convention Center edition on this theme. All my public, pretty much all my public art is focused on the Japanese American history theme. Um, I'm doing uh, tile mosaic panels for Redmond Sound Transit about um, boys playing rock, paper, scissors inside one of the camps. I'm doing a balcony rail in the International District and a mixed use zone park in Bellevue celebrating Japanese heritage and a project for Meta Open Arts as well, um, and many more. So there's lots of different applications and it's really fun to see how the paper cut medium can translate so well into all of those things. Um, I didn't really know how versatile it could be before, but in the last few years, I've had the great opportunity to really like expand what I'm doing, um, but still in the medium of paper cut, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's exciting to know we'll get to see your work all over Seattle. Coming yeah, up. very soon. Um, all right, my colleague Danielle Higa is saying in the chat, maybe Grandma Clara might consider digitizing her photo collection. So <laughs> I <laughs> just put an inquiry in last night um, to a friend of mine who is going to help me make that happen. Yeah. Okay. I also know a few archivists who might be able to help you. Yeah. Well, I was thinking that too. I mean, <laughs> what's, what's the process? Actually, what is the process? Because people ask me all the time. That might be an interesting. Yeah. Um, we have a collection nomination form, I believe, on our website. Um, uh, but yeah, so typically we talk one-on-one -on -one to potential donors and, you know, we're not able to digitize everything that's suggested to Dencho, but um, we try to do our best to get to most things. So okay. uh, yeah, let's let's keep talking. Okay. After. Yeah. So there is the Hattori collection already, the Clara Hattori collection on Densho. Um, but I know I look through everything and there's a lot of things that are not there yet. So it'd be cool to add to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then on a related note, um, 
Barbara Yasui is asking if there's going to be a key to the memory net, um, which is a great question. I think you know we're planning to try to put um, some of the photos that were submitted and I think photos of the individual objects that you create at Lauren. Um, we're digitizing those and we're going to have those in the um, DDR as well. Um, we're trying to get better about kind of documenting our own work that we do at Densho and our arts projects that we're involved yeah, in. Gonna, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a great idea to create, you know, maybe this needs to be a little bit more of a booklet that can kind of uh, be accessible with the, the piece as well. Yeah, that would be great. I have created like a legend of um, some of the objects that I use regularly in my own work, but I think these would be very, very cool to have like the story, the name of the person who submitted and in one document or one place that people could browse. That would be very cool. Yeah. Great. So um, we were hoping to keep this to around half an hour. We know everyone has a lot of events and a lot of uh, Zoom events in particular going on this weekend. So um, and then right after this, we're going to finish installing the rest of the memory net. So it'll be hanging from the Densho ceiling uh, for hopefully many years to come. Um, so we'll close out um, unless, Lauren, you had anything else you wanted to share. Um, I just want to say thank you to Densho um, for naming me as one of the artists in residence for last year. It's been a real honor to work with you guys and just to have a closer relationship with Densho and um, because really a significant portion of my art career has been based on my research through your archives. So it's really cool to be able to support what you do. And I hope that Densho continues to be a really important source of education about this topic for future generations. Um, I'll also say that today is the last day of um, the exhibition that is um, at Art Exchange Gallery in Pioneer Square. They're open until 5.30 p.m. tonight, and it's all um, the work that I created during my Densho artist residence year last year. It's called Citizens Indefinite Leave, and it has about 20 new original hand-cut paper um, pieces in there. So. If you can go by, they're open till 5.30. <laughs> I highly recommend it if people can get there in the next two hours. Yeah, you can see it online as well through the Art Exchange Gallery's website. Yeah. It's so incredible in person too, though. Okay, we have sirens coming down. I think that's a great okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks.